verse and goes to the end of the chapter. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they that also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me, having given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even As you have loved me. Father. I want those. You have given to me. To be with me. Where I am. And to see my glory. The glory you have given me. Because. You love me. Before the creation of the world. Righteous father. Though the world does not know you. I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Jerry. Well, this is a week, a Memorial Day weekend. We call this Memorial Sunday sometimes. And I do want to especially thank all of you who are veterans. I know we have a number of them here in our congregation. Uh, we want to thank uh, those of you who served, who were willing to put your lives on the line. And, of course, on this uh, weekend, we remember those who uh, were willing to serve and, and did uh, pay, pay the ultimate price. And so I want to say thank you to our veterans. Uh, my father uh, was a veteran. I, I never served in the military. I was in that age group. When I uh, got to be old enough, the, the draft, uh, you didn't have to register for the draft there for a period of time. I was in, in that category, uh, just happened to be the, the year that I was born, uh, but uh, my father served in World War II. He was in the uh, U.S. Army Air Corps, which was the precursor to the Air Force. He enlisted and served overseas. He was a, a flight engineer and top turret gunner on a B-17 uh, bomber stationed in England, and he never uh, talked about his service. It was, he was always very quiet about that. He was a very proud and patriotic man, uh, but never really talked about his time in the military. As I got older, and I then took an interest in flying myself, and, and uh, I would ask him some questions, and, and he would share uh, some information, but never uh, talked about his service. I think some of the memories he just wanted to, to let them go. Um, we did find his service record, though, eventually. He had a folder, and uh, he, he served uh, flu missions on D-Day. We're coming up in the next couple of weeks to uh, commemorating the 75th anniversary of, of D-Day. And he flew missions from England into, uh, into Europe uh, at that time. And so I want to celebrate and, and remember all of those, all of you who, who have served in, in, the, in the service. Um, you know, we're fast losing uh, that generation, that World War II uh, generation. And we don't want to forget. We, we want to remember so that we can continue to move forward uh, and, and to enjoy the freedom that we certainly enjoy. We uh, just sang that song, Onward Christian Soldiers. It's a, it's a song that in many circles has, uh, has found disfavor uh, because of, well, really for two reasons. Some say it's too militaristic. Uh, it's, you know, um, 
you know, you, have, you don't want to celebrate war, so to speak, kind of like that little children's song, I'm in the Lord's Army. Uh, and yet, you know, there, there are some parts of that that are important. Uh, early, the early Christians uh, refused to bear arms. They left it up to God, not the weapons of war. And I think we always have to uh, regard war as a last resort. It, it, it has to be only for desperate situations. Uh, but the other thing that sometimes people see in that, in that particular uh, hymn is it's uh, too triumphalist. You know, sometimes the folks feel it's a little sensitive for uh, people of other religions and persuasions. And, of course, we find ourselves living in neighborhoods next to people of other faiths and, and uh, people of no faith. And, and so uh, maybe we do have to be careful about that. People might get a little nervous. We march out of here, you know, singing forward into battle, see, see his banners go. Uh, and yet, in some ways, we, we are like an army. And that's what I wanted to, to think about and, and talk about today in this Memorial Day weekend. We remember those who have, have gone before us. We remember those who, who died serving our country. And, and perhaps that image of an army is something that we can learn from, uh, even for, for us today. I think we, have, uh, we, we can learn some special things, for, even from this prayer that, that Jesus is, is, is praying here. And I think in, in many ways, the church is like an army. And one of those ways is supposed to be in our unity. That's one of the things that Jesus prays for. As Jerry pointed out, this, is, this, is the, this whole chapter 17 is a prayer of Jesus. He's praying uh, for himself. He's praying for his disciples. And he prays for us, for his believers. And one of the themes of his prayer for us is that we would be unified, that we would experience unity. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. He prayed that, that we would be one. Uh, we, he prayed that his church, his followers, would be known by, by their unity. And that doesn't just mean that we won't be arguing and, and fighting, which unfortunately does happen sometimes in the church. It means that we're going to be there for one another. We're going to come together. We're going to be unified to help one another and lift each other up. Years ago, as part of a continuing education uh, series, really, called the Beeson Institute for Advanced Church Leadership. And I attended conferences at different churches around the country. It was set up as a three-year program. Uh, There were nine different modules, they were called. There were three each year. And we would go to churches all around the country who were on the cutting edge of ministry at that time. Some of you may even have heard that name, the Beeson Institute for Advanced Church Leadership. One of our former pastors here at Jarrettown, Gary Nicholson, also did that as a continuing education event. Gary and I would end up at these conferences together uh, on many occasions. And the dean of the program at that time was Dr. Dale Galloway. Uh, Dale Galloway, he was on the faculty at Asbury Theological Seminary uh, while he was overseeing this this continuing education, but he had been a pastor, and one of his claims to fame, so to speak, was starting a church from nothing and building it to over 6,000 members in Portland, Oregon. And he he started uh, the church in a drive-in movie theater. Uh, Dale and his wife Margie, who played the piano, would be on the, uh, they would lead the service from the roof of the, of the refreshment stand at the drive-in theater. And that's how the church got started. Eventually, uh, they built a building, of course, and uh, Dale tells the story of a single mother who belonged to the church in those early days. Uh, she was involved in a woman's group at the church. And one of the members of the group one time said to her, one of the meetings, she said, Donna, you, you look yellow. Have you been to see a doctor? And Donna said that no, she had not been able to go see a doctor. She couldn't afford insurance. And so the members of the group, they came together and they got the money together so that at least she could go and and have an exam. So she went to the doctor and she found out that she was having some liver problems and she needed a liver transplant. And she needed it pretty quickly or, or she was going to die. And the doctors told her that the specialists that would be best for her in that situation, uh, were in Texas, and they could perform the operation for $140,000. This is back in the early 90s. I have no idea what those uh, costs would be now. Uh, But anyway, the situation seemed impossible uh, for this this young mother. Well, the women in the small group went to talk to Dale Galloway, the pastor, uh, about whether or not the church could do anything for Donna. Well, the church was in the midst of a building program. They were were $400,000 in debt themselves. And Dale Galloway felt that the congregation was pretty tapped out financially. Uh, He was losing sleep over their finances. Then he was losing more sleep now over Donna's situation. And he he finally prayed uh, about Donna's situation and came came to the conclusion that the church should be and, and would be willing to help. 
And uh, so uh, they, they got uh, some resources together. There was a lay leader in the church who was a prominent businessman. They started a campaign. Of course, they were going to have to raise the money pretty quickly. The campaign was called Save My Mom. Another person volunteered uh, their time to be a leader uh, for six weeks for this campaign to happen. And that Sunday, the pastor, Dale, uh, shared with the whole congregation what was going on. And they took a special offering. And he was amazed that they got $60,000 $60,000 in that first offering uh, to support Donna. And the next day, Dale Galloway got an invitation to go and appear before the Oregon legislature, along with Donna, to talk about people who couldn't afford insurance. Well, that uh, event caused uh, news reports. There were newspaper articles. The local TV station got involved. And within seven days, they raised $220,000 to send Donna to Texas to get this uh, surgery that, that she needed. It was amazing uh, that they came together. They were, they were unified. Ten years later, Dale Galloway says, when people thought about his church, they didn't think about that nice new building that they had just built. They thought about this church that came together to send this young woman to Texas to get the surgery that she needed. Someone has said that the church is the only army that shoots its wounded. That's a terrible indictment of us as people, as people of Christ. But isn't that true? Uh, So often when people are having difficulties, when people fail for one reason or another, they drop out of the church. They don't want anyone to know. Oftentimes it's because they're embarrassed or they don't want to ask for help. But we're a family. We're the body of Christ. I hope no one in our church ever feels that way. We're here to support one another and lift each other up. We come together to do that. That's where our, our unity comes in. And I think that's the first characteristic that we can take away from uh, the church to, to being like an army. The second one is uh, an army has its purpose. It has its purpose, its goals. It has what it's supposed to do. And, and an army that forgets its purpose is in a lot of trouble. So let's be clear about our purpose as a church. We're to save those who are lost. We might not use that terminology anymore. A lot of people don't like to talk about people being lost. Uh, people have different definitions of that. Sometimes people feel that people who don't know Jesus are lost. Or people who are down and out, having going through difficult times, are, are people who are lost. Uh, my own faith says that anyone who needs to hear of the good news of, of Jesus Christ, who needs to hear of God's love in their lives, are someone who needs to hear the gospel. We may not use the terminology of being lost, but we need to reach out to those. And we need to be able to show the church and, and share the church as a place where people can come and be welcome. Where the, where the people who are hopeless can find hope. Where, where people who are in despair can find peace. Where people who are uh, joyless can find joy in their lives. And where people who, who don't feel loved can come and know that they are loved. They're loved by, by God and loved by us. And so we need to be clear about what our purpose is. And we've been talking about that here in the leadership of, of our church. And you may have seen our, our new mission statement. It's, it's very simple. It's based on the Bible. And, and it says the mission of Jarrettown United Methodist Church is to empower all people to become totally committed followers of Jesus Christ. That's what we are about. That's what we're, our purpose is. That's what our mission is, to empower all people to become totally committed followers of Jesus Christ. An army that forgets its purpose is in trouble. Uh, An army that gets too scattered uh, becomes ineffective. A fellow by the name of Robert Dale wrote a book called Leadership for a Changing Church. He uses this analogy. This is a true, true experience of his. He says, suppose you're walking down a real street in Kokomo, Indiana, and you read this actual sign. Burgers, fries, shakes, and bait. Now, would that sign cause you to want to visit that establishment? Would you, Dale asks, consider any store where menu options might include a cheeseburger with a side of night crawlers? <laughs> they lost their focus there somewhere along the line. They're about burgers and shakes and fries, but they thought, well, maybe we'll help the fishermen too, so we'll offer bait. Um, that, it might not be a bad place to go to, but we need to be clear about what our purpose is, what our mission is to empower all people to become totally committed followers of Jesus Christ. And now let me be clear. Uh, I don't use this language a lot, but we are in a spiritual battle. 
There, there's no question about that. There is a battle going on in this world between good and bad, or good and evil, between light and darkness, and, and we're in that spiritual battle constantly. And so we need to be prepared to face whatever comes our way. Because there are certainly evil elements, whether you use the terminology evil one or the devil or Satan or whatever, there are certainly evil elements who seek to uh, distract us from our purpose, right? It happens, it happens in our own lives, right? We, we know, you know, one of the things I always have said with confirmation classes, I'll ask the, the uh, young people there, they know the difference between right and wrong. They, they know what's right and what's wrong. But still, sometimes they get led astray, right? So the wrong element, the evil, gets in there sometimes. We know the difference between right and wrong, but we're in this battle constantly. And, and it manifests itself in many different ways. So we face that as individual followers of Jesus. We face it as a local church sometimes. And, and we face it as a denomination. We face it as Christianity, you know, within the world. There's evil that tries to distract us from our purpose. I experienced this a couple of times in one church that I served. One was in, in relation to a staff member. Um, there was just this negative feeling that he was bringing out. I, don't, I, don't, I can't even really explain it, except it was the spiritual battle. Uh, and so there was a tension. Uh, there was this negative feeling in the church. We had a staff meeting one time, and, and we were talking about it. And he said, well, what do you think is causing this, this tension? And, and I boldly said, well, you are. And he uh, just lost it. I was glad there were other staff people there, uh, not, not for my safety, but so that they could experience, you know, they could see what, uh, what, what he was saying, what his attitude was. Uh, but that was a, uh, it was a very intense time. Uh, he ended up leaving uh, shortly after that. Uh, but you could, it was palpable. You could, you could feel it, the tension in the church, the negativity. And there was another time uh, later on where it actually came out of a, a complete misunderstanding of something that someone said in, a, in the Sunday school situation, among Sunday school teachers. Complete misunderstanding. There was nothing that I could do to, to point out that it was a misunderstanding. And, of course, now in these days of Facebook, people were attacking each other in Facebook posts people from the church, and, and I just couldn't believe that this was blowing up the way it was. I got, I got everybody together. I had another group of people praying for us in another room in the church as we met, and we, we hashed things out, and um, I, I, I have a feeling that the friction always continued, although all those people did stay involved in the ministry, uh, but it happens. We, we face that all the, all the time, and I think we see it in our denomination, you know, there's, there's a distraction uh, trying to tear us apart. I said this at the earlier service. I didn't say it at all the services. But, um, you know, we get distracted from what our purpose is, what, what we're about. Uh, it, for me, you know, I, I don't, this is the way I say it. I might get in trouble for this. But I don't really care what your sexual orientation is. I care about whether you know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Jesus will work all of that other stuff out. And we've been distracted, as a, as a, even as a church to a limited extent, but we've been distracted as a denomination. We need to know what our purpose is. And the United Methodist Church actually says our purpose is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's what, that's what we say our purpose is. You know, all these other things are just a distraction when they seek to separate us and, and pull us apart. And so I think, you know, we can be like an army in our unity. We can be like our, an army following our purpose if we're true to that. And we can also be like an army if with our devotion to our commander-in-chief, who is our risen Savior. We need to be devoted to Jesus Christ, follow his will for our lives, follow his will for our church, follow his will for our denomination. You know, there, there are many opportunities that we have uh, to be led down the wrong path. But if we follow the path that Jesus wants us to follow, we'll be doing the right thing. And that's our goal. That's our goal. That's our mission for our church here, to follow where God leads, where God guides, so that we can be this, this place of, of, of light, of good in our community uh, that would attract other people. And so we can be like an army in our unity, in our faithfulness to following our purpose, and in, in devotion to our, to our leader, to our risen Savior, Jesus.
Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you so much for, uh, for this day and for this time. We thank you for this weekend when we remember those who have gone before us, who have paved the way, and those who have actually given their lives so that we can be free. And so, Lord, help us to be unified. Help us to follow the purpose that you have in store for us, uh, the purpose that you have for us to follow. And help us to always be devoted to our, our commander-in-chief, your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.